I'm Ryan Gander. I work with ideas and concepts and I try to reconvey them in a visual language. Signs, symbols, meanings that aren't always obvious. Conceptual art often divides people, but it's meant to make you think. And there's one place in particular where people always seem to try to understand what I do. And that's Japan. The Japanese have a super developed visual culture, a highly sophisticated take on even simple imagery. I go there a lot and it's a constant source of inspiration. So this is it, we're in the eye of the storm. My work is fueled by visual references, pointers that might one day become ideas for artworks. And so many of them are Japanese. Things that don't always mean what they see, much more than just what they are. Japan is dense with imagery that speaks of order and novelty, respect and innovation. Ideas from a deep past that look to the future. The ancient icons of the geisha, samurai and even the cherry blossom embody old ideas, but they have more to reveal. So I want to explore what images like these mean to us and to the Japanese themselves. Every country has its defining imagery, but ours doesn't change much. The White Cliffs of Dover have always been a stiff upper lip made of chalk. But in Japan's symbolism is so vibrant, it mutates. And I think it's because the Japanese have a special relationship with time. When I think about history and tradition, from a British perspective, I think about Dad's army, the empire, people moaning about how great it was in the good old days. And when I come to Japan, I think about how it informs society, how people use it as a sort of toolkit and learn from it and use parts of their history to help them live their lives in an optimistic and really functional, pragmatic way. But that can leave you with a present tense that's tricky to pin down. A unique, elusive mix of past and future. But it's up for reinvention this is the Shinto Shrine at Desayafu in southwestern Japan. And this is Arata-chan, a character that I designed when I created a new spring holiday festival for the shrine's owners. So artworks don't always have to be physical objects. They can be stories or they can be moments. And every year for the last five years, Desayafu has celebrated a national holiday that's called New New Day. New New Day was designed for, to encourage people to clean up after themselves. Famously, the architect Le Cabousier, who was an infamous modernist, had a saying that was, by law, all buildings should be white. So Aratichan is based on a sort of collision of a Ganda Manga character and Le Cabousier. He's got Le Cabousier's glasses. Whoever's in here must be so warm. Got Le Cabissier's glasses and he's got a white paintbrush and a tin of white paint. He makes things clean. And not cleaning as in making things white and tidying up, but it's to do with a bigger picture of cleanliness. Aratachan embodies symbolism. Everything about him I've tried to think out as using visual language to communicate a series of ideas. And What's really interesting is that's my job, it's sort of like my trade. But that doesn't happen a lot in the UK in day-to-day -day culture, but it happens all the time in this country. A lot of these images have something in common, and that's the fact that we in the West probably read them differently to someone Japanese. Take the famous scramble crossing in Shibuya, Tokyo. In all media all over the world, Images from here symbolise the intensity of modern urban living. Tokyo defines tightly packed. In the centre itself, there's 13 million people, and including all the outer boroughs, it's now pushing 40 million. No other country has a bigger city than Tokyo, and because Tokyo is a first world capital, it seems to sound a warning to the world. Japanese see it differently. 
This is the choir before the storm. Now this is the storm. It seems as if there's just chaos, confusion and mayhem here. But if you peel back the layers a little bit and you look under the surface, it's all really harmonious and it all works as one entity together. It's as if there's a sort of order that comes out of the chaos of it. So this is it, we're in the eye of the storm, um, surrounded by total confusion. But still, everyone's really tolerant. There's no arguments. There's a few collisions and a few people running backwards from their point of no return, but everyone's still very respectful. The Japanese pretty much invented the image of the modern megacity, but there's an order in what looks like disorder. Apparent chaos is actually industry. Civilised behaviour, not angry commuters, and I've got a suspicion where this comes from. Buddhism came from China and overlaid pre-existing beliefs known as Shinto, the way of the gods. Most people go to shrines, but the emphasis is on practice, not faith. Doing physical things that show that they observe the important distinctions that let them get on with harmonious life as part of a group. At the entrance to every Shinto shrine is some variation on this symbol, the Red Tori Gate. It's a symbol you walk through, a line between the sacred world and the secular, between order and disorder and the shrine is a public space that's open to all. Shinto is an animist faith, so things like rocks and trees and water and mountains and landscapes, they all are part of this very symbolic picture that makes up the Shinto way of life. And those objects and those things, they have a kami inside them. And kami is kind of an inner spirit of the object. So the shrine itself, is kind of like a symbolic spiritual power station. Crowds of the faithful come to feel the force, to touch, to connect. And Shinto prioritizes cleanliness, both real and symbolic. Here in the grounds of the shrine, but before we enter the main shrine building where you go to pray, there's a sort of purification ceremony that takes place. And it's a really important stage of the whole process of going to pray. It prepares you and sort of stills your mind before you go into the main building. Head priest Masako is ready to help me with a procedure that looks complicated, especially the last part. What's the significance of the part at the end where you tip this ladle and the water runs down the handle? さっと手掴めるように自分が握ったところを清めるとで、自分のまず手を清めて、そして口を清めて、だからその自分が握ったところの杖をもう一回水で清めて置くんですね。ですから神道というのはこういう清めの信仰、いわゆるその汚れを
Each of these is a unique print, the screen printing, they're all incredibly beautiful. And there's thousands of different designs. They're full of sort of a metaphor, symbolic meaning in the imagery, but also there's a function to them. They're a utility thing, which sort of embodies that design for Shinto living. There's something about the uh, economy of them, of keeping them and caring for them. Even though this thing is for cleaning other things, you would clean the thing itself and reuse the thing itself. So there's a nice sort of economy of recycling and an economy of reuse, which is really Japanese. When you're here, it's easy to see how Kanagara, the way of the community-minded Shinto gods, promotes a sense of well-being and of order. In Britain, in London, during the Olympics, the British media were really intrigued to see Japanese spectators at the end of all games in the stadiums coming together and cleaning up after everybody else. These primary school pupils are cleaning for the camera. Tidying is on the timetable and we had just 20 minutes to film it between lunch and the start of maths. It seems like because this happens every day, it's such an everyday occurrence that there's no instruction. All these little kids know exactly what to do. There's a nice sort of sustainability, sort of ecosystem to it as well. All these kids are essentially just looking after themselves. From the cradle, the Japanese learn to take care of their surroundings, and Shinto helps them see themselves as part of the natural environment, which demands care and attention in the here and now, rather than waiting for reward in the afterlife. Being here today and seeing all these kids working together as one entity for one single cause, I've never seen anything like it. It's, a, it's really intriguing. And it makes me think that we probably have a lot that we could learn from this in the UK. And I think when I get home and I see some fool in the car in front of me throwing a chocolate wrapper out the window, it's going to make that prospect even more infuriating. said that there's two kinds of society, those where people jaywalk and those where they wait for the green symbol, even if there's no traffic. Here, people respect the rules of oil society and they're shocked by anyone who breaks them. This mindset makes Japan one of the least crime-ridden societies on Earth, which is probably why not many thrillers are set Japanese police stations. For the civically minded Japanese, crime is antisocial and therefore it's disgraceful as well. And most Japanese wouldn't think twice about informing on a criminal. And for those that do try their luck, supposedly there's a 99% detection rate. Of course there is crime here. It's a patriarchal society and domestic violence against women often goes unreported. But that isn't exclusive to Japan. The elephant in the room is the Yakuza, and the Yakuza are essentially Japanese gangsters. It's an organised crime network, and they're not a new thing. They've been around for a long, long time. What's interesting to me about the Yakuza is the way that they have this sort of semi-legitimate status in society. They've been known to take part in religious processions and help save uh, earthquake victims in natural disasters and things like that. They are part of the fabric and the makeup of society. But I also think they're probably some sort of visual signifier and that's quite important for the law-abiding citizens to see. They work like a visual scapegoat. And this being Japan, they have a dense symbolism all of their own, which is a celebration of their non-conformity. To turn on society they cover in tattoos. Innocent images from history and folklore transformed in meaning when they're inked onto the skin. Playing with this idea a few years ago, I designed a tattoo for a friend in Tokyo. Cartoon stars playful enough in the West, inked into his back, become something more illicit. The 
moment the needle touched his skin, my friend Daiska went from respectable businessman and art collector to outsider. Well, at least when he didn't have his shirt on. It feels very strange being with a man who is taking his top off in a twin room. <laughs> Can I touch it? Yeah. You've got lots of tattoos. How many do you have? Five. And each one is by a different artist? Yes. My tattoo collection is contemporary art. Many of my friends are young artists. Some of them are very upcoming. This is not just tattoo. It's like a commission work for me. When I come to Japan, one of the things that I look forward to the most mm. is going to the hot spring. And I know that you're not allowed to have a tattoo in the hot spring. Does that mean you can't go to an onsen at all? In Japan, it's very difficult to enjoy onsen, public bus, uh, sport gym, public beach too. In Japan, the tattoo was illegal for a long time. Conservative people, older generation, so still misunderstand. So the tattoo is a symbol of mafia, yakuza, a very dirty part of Japan. Mm -hmm. As a salary man mm. in society, mm. you're very much an insider and one of the collective. Mm. But under your clothes, you're kind of like an outsider, but it's a secret. Mm. So you've had to give up quite a lot yeah. from your life. You have to, there's things now that you can't do because of your collection. Yeah. These aren't just tattoos, they're taboos. And it's the medium that is the message. Tattoos themselves signify transgression, whatever the image. I don't get a message about criminality, but then I'm not Japanese. The studio of Yokohama's master tattooist, Yoshihito Nakano, known by the title Horiyoshi III. He isn't a Yakuza, though over his 50-year career, he must have inked a few. Yoshi's client today isn't a gangster, it's his son, Kazuyoshi, also a master needle artist. Both men are happy to bear designs they can't display outdoors in daylight because they're proud of their art and they want to change public opinion. The designs are dignified and the work is clearly skilled. So why do they cause fear and loathing? ま、there's some kind of tradition that you follow. That tradition must also be in the symbolism. その、ストーリーの中の一部分を切り出してストップモーションをかけたのが日本の入れ墨。ただし、闇雲に動物と花を掘るわけではなくて、例えば唐寿司とボタンはなぜ唐寿司ボタンとかっていうふうに掘るか
In Japan, signs and their meanings can shift over time. That's exactly what's happened to the most powerful Japanese symbol of all. The geisha, a living embodiment of old Japan. Today, it's Kyoto that's the main center of geisha culture. Two hours and 18 minutes exactly from Tokyo by bullet train. Never more, never less. These living relics are only normally seen by the wealthy and the powerful. But once a year, the public queue up just to be near them and to be served tea. The geisha tell their story to the people, and the people hang on every word. To the Westerner, a geisha symbolises the past, enigmatic confidants, and maybe even courtesans. But what are they now to the Japanese? Where do they fit into modern life? Now, Suzu is a geiko, as geisha in Kyoto are known. What's the differences between the work that you would have done in ancient times and the work you do now? So, this is the event. あの、百貨店に行って特設ステージで踊ったりとか、京都、京都のプロモーションで行ったりとかいう、そういうイベントのお仕事が増えてると思います。What is it the men who employ you are looking for that they can't find at home or at work in offices or in a boardroom? お客様が、まあお客様をご招待されてる時に、あの。うちらが入るんですけど、そしたらまあお客様が別に喋らなくても私たちがそのお客様に喋りますので、もう安心感というか、日本で芸妓さんを呼んでその宴会するっていうのは結構貴重なことで、あんまりないんですね。それでまあそ
だからその人のことも結構こう本当に友人友達のような関係でもあります上辺って一番良くないんでだから俺らがちゃんと彼女がどうしたら仲良くなれるのかなっていうのを考えた上で接客したりあのいろんな話を聞き出してるうちに深く関係を縮まったりとかするんで。So I can't help but、um, draw comparisons between you and the geisha. 似てる分もあるかもしれないですね。優しくしてあげるだけじゃなくて、本当に思いやりっていうか、そういう気持ちで接するのがホストだと思うんで、友達には言えないことだったり、まあ仕事でストレス溜まってるから、俺らになんか愚痴言いに来るだけっていう人もいるんで、ただ聞いてあげるだけでも。ストレス解消になるっていうかその優しく聞いてあげるだけの時もありますねはい。In bars like this, old world charm is provided by the entrepreneurial young. The past informs the future of hospitality. The romanticism of the geisha has almost evaporated, but that sort of tranquil force that she has still remains. And the host boy brings something new to the role of the geisha, but he still has that sort of traditional sympathetic ear. Now, you'd think that in Japan, the weight of the history would make it a really difficult place to innovate, but that's simply not true. And I think that's because this is a society that is transfixed with novelty. And that can be seen really clearly in the street fashions of Harajuku. This Tokyo district is at the leading edge of newness. So we're here in Harajuku, which is it's an area where all the teenagers and fashionistas come and congregate and show off their bonkers-looking outfits. It's a bit like the, what the King's Road would be, you know, 30 years ago. New street fashions take a little time to bed in. But in Harajuku, styles come and go like bullet trains. It's a gathering point and a meeting point, but also it's a bit like a place where everyone opens their peacock feathers and shows off. For someone who lives in the countryside, I find it a little bit stressful. Just the extremeness. I don't know where, which way to look because there's so much happening. It's like an overload to the senses. People are dressed like you've never seen before. That inventiveness, that writing an identity for yourself, and it's part of a social makeup. The innovation and the quirkiness in what people are wearing here. This is a real demonstration of people not thinking the same, not this collective consciousness, not this collective ideal of society, but of individuality. This is Japanese exuberance, and for every cliched salary worker in a blue suit, there's a fashionista here starting a new trend. As editor of Fruits magazine, Soshi Ayuki has watched them come and go for 20 years. Fruits 始めた頃はすごくこうヒートアップしてたので。三ヶ月に一回ぐらいこう新しいファッションになっていって、This is soft punk we call it. Soft punk, yeah. So is the hard punk as well. Yeah. What would this be? This looks a little bit s i s t i e s hippie inspired. I think so. In the West, new styles soon go high street and international, but most of these seem to stay in Tokyo, or even just in this district. もう一つはこう一年二年で。これはあのデコラファッションって呼ばれるようになるんですけどそこまであのちょっと進化しちゃってちょっと次に行き場がなくなっちゃったっていうのもあると思うのとあとこの子たちもあのそんなに原宿のファッションすごくこう狭い世界のファッションなのでそんなオープンじゃないのであるその原宿の中に引きこもっているっていうことは言えるかもしれないです。Take the Lolita look. 19th century Gothic European references. A classic example of the magpie tendency in Japan, which is both sexes thinking outside the clothes box. It's a fusion of different hierarchies and cultures and classes, as well as a mixture of time. Do a lot of the fashions here in Harajuku do that? Take something from the ancient and fuse it with the modern. 
、うん、この時期はそういうことがありましたねこれもそうだしコメディギャルソンっぽいパンツに着物をミックスしていったりここの紐が面白かったりしますよね。うん、こ,のこの時期期間はすごく着物を意識してこの子たちは取り入れていてそれってすごくあの今までになかったちょっと結構革命的なことだったんですけども日本人のこうなんかそういう,こう歴史的なこうなんだろうな,なんか DNA に入っているような気はしますねそういう。でそれがこう出てきている。In 20 years, you must have seen so many young people with so many different styles and so many categories and subcategories of styles that you've exhausted it. Maybe there's nothing left that's new for you. あの今すごく原宿のファッションがこうおとなしくなっているので、時代の流れで今こうそういういろんなスタイルがなくて同じ格好になろうとしている時代なので、そういうジェンダーレス的な子たち。はなんかこう先端を切ってなんか新しい試みをやってくれる可能性はありますね。ジェンダーフルイディティ is a hot topic all over the world right now, and a Suki Devil is a celebrity exponent of the next big thing: genderless fashion. All over the world, there's a lot of chat about gender fluidity as a kind of movement or a new genre. Can you tell me a little bit about this genderless fashion? 日本で流行っているジェンダーレスファッションというのが、そのと女性の服を男性が着たり、男性の服を女性が着るっていうそのなんだろうな性別にとらわれないファッションのジャンルで、僕もすごくジェンダーレスのファッションは大好きで、例えば逆に僕は男性で女性の服を着たりメイクをしたりしているんですけど、逆に女性で男性の服を着ている人とか、女性で男性らしい人もすごく好きだし。So, what was your style before this style? と元々はすごく可愛いものが好きだったんですけど、その可愛いをこうどんどん可愛いものを見ていくうちにたどり着いたのがそうもうレディースのファッションだったりで。What is it about Harajuku specifically where there's this need for speed and for innovation and invention? もう流行りがどんどんどんどんどんどん変わっていく。そのスパンってものがすごく早い。ですけど、そのなんでそんなに原宿の流行っていうのはすぐ切り替わるのかっていうと、僕が思うのは、多分原宿の人っていうのは常に新しいものがすごく大好きだから、今ここに存在してないものをに興味を持って何かが流行り出したらすぐそこに行くんですけど、そのものが流行ったらその流行ってるっていう理由だけでダサいってダサいっていうかそのちょっとダサい。からっていう理由でもっと常に新しいものを求めている人が多いからそのその物新しさがすごい今の若い人たちを引きつけているのかなと思います。The youth of Harajuku face a dilemma: if novelty becomes a convention that everybody chases, that becomes conformity, which is surely what their parents are all about. I reckon the Japanese love of novelty has a start date. 19th century Big Bang in what was then the capital, Kyoto. On the 3rd of March in 1868, the sudden coup took place here in Kyoto, and the shogun that had ruled Japan for 700 years or more and restricted relations with the outside world were overthrown by the young Emperor Meiji. When North America and Europe demanded free trade, Meiji really turned on the tap. And it was at that moment when lots of new technologies and exciting new things came into Japan and started to change the culture. And for me, I think it's at that very time that the futuristic Japan that we think of today was really born. But even before Emperor Meiji, Japan was no backwater. The shoguns had traded widely within East Asia, and over centuries of peace, the people became extremely sophisticated, super literate. And consumer orientated. So now Western merchants race to service this new market. The new emperor made Tokyo his capital and started shopping. Within a few years, Japan had the start of a world class railway system, gas light, factories, and telegraphy. It was industrial revolution at breakneck speed. Japan shifted tents in an instant from past to future. And the past wasn't disrespected in this process. 
it was used as a tool to inform the future. Among the new ideas to arrive from the West was photography, and Japanese views like these helped create the first real ideas and cliches of Japan abroad. Meanwhile, the Japanese fell in love with the camera itself. The new technology spoke to something deep in a people who understood layered meaning. It was an instant. Time stopped. Sentiment crystallised. It was science in the service of magic, delivering the art of the past. This wasn't just about taking pictures, it was business. The camera, of course, also represents Japanese electronics, but there's a bigger meaning here that I'm interested in, and that's the Japanese ability to spot the potential in existing emerging technology, to refine it and to sell it back to the world. Within the century, the Japanese dominated the camera industry. They didn't invent the chemical film business, but they created the digital technology that made it obsolete and sold us the new cameras to use it. They won the technological game, but being Japanese, there's some old fashioned grit in their futuristic oyster. There's a sort of divine super loop here. From the nation that bought us the digital revolution and the digital sensor, we are now seeing an increased popularity in film cameras. What's really interesting is this brand that makes incredible lenses and optics is German, not Japanese. But it's probably the most popular brand for photo specialists in Japan. We're in a country that holds very dear to notions of the future, but we're seeing obsolete technology fetishized. And I think that has a lot to do with the pace of life and the speed of things. Analog cameras are slow technology, just like a, a record. And there's a love for the analog world at the moment because the pace in which we live, maybe we feel like we don't experience things in the depth that we used to. What's interesting about these is that for a select you, a group that are in the know, these cameras signal a sort of value of consideration or a shared skill set. These cameras they're really like for making photographs, not for taking pictures. They're incredibly hard to use. I've had this one for a number of years and I still want to pick it up after using my digital one. It's a real pain. But for many Japanese, loss for the future is freighted with a longing for the past creating a present tense that puts a modern obsessive premium on the vintage. Dr. Angus Lockyer lectures in Japanese history. I find the present tense hard to spot, but does he? I see it differently. I see um, a place which is very intensely focused on the present, on the now. They do have a kind of easiness in going back into the past and bringing it forward and using it now. There's an openness to the new. Japan was a very effective consumer society way before we got into shopping. It's certainly an interest in novelty and having something that's slightly different from everybody else. You know, the ease with which Japan embraces things like robots. R robots aren't scary in Japan. Turns out some old people would prefer a robot to take care of intimate needs than a human being in front of whom they might need to face shame. Can you tell me a little bit about what Shinto has handed down yeah. to today's modern reality of Japan. Shinto is much more about cycles. You know, they knock down one of the most important trends in Japan every 20 years and rebuild it. Because you don't need the original, you don't need to hold on to the past. What you need is to make sure that the past helps you to cope with the present. Acceptance of the fact that you're on a planet that's unstable, that this moment will vanish. In Shinto, it's not us versus nature, it's no, we're, we're part of the environment which we're affecting. This is Hokusai's wave. The title of the artwork is The Great Wave. And it's one of my favorite artworks. It's a woodblock print from the 1830s, but I've not picked it because I like it so much. I've picked it because it's a good signifier of a new beginning. A lot of historians say that this wave was in fact a tsunami, but that's debatable. One thing we do know is that it was a destructive wave and with destruction comes a new beginning. Something Buddhism says we should all be prepared for. The Japanese live in the moment because they understand there might not be another one. After all, 
They've survived the most symbolic full stop of all. This is by far the most significant symbolic object that I've come across in Japan. It's a small pocket watch that was carried by a pedestrian in the city of Hiroshima in August 1945, the day that the uranium bomb was exploded above the city by the Americans on behalf of all the Allied forces. And that bomb killed 140,000 people. Now, in March of the same year, a series of incendiary devices had been um, exploded over Tokyo. And the death count of those bombings killed a much greater number of civilians. But what was key about this bomb is that it was new technology. The atom bomb was as much of a massive symbol of defeat as the Industrial Revolution was a symbol of success. But the Japanese had spotted the potential in nuclear energy. And within 10 years, they'd began to invest heavily in nuclear reactors. They leapt at the chance of a high-tech future and the opportunity to lay the recent past to rest. But buried in the Japanese subconscious was a new kind of monster, a prehistoric, and the terrifyingly modern. Godzilla. In 1954, the B-movie Monster Mutant stomped onto the screens, spawned from an atomic disaster, and with his signature weapon, his nuclear breath, he was by all accounts quite a vengeful creature. But he was also an agent of change. Godzilla was a Shintosaurus innately understood by Japanese moviegoers rebuilding their world in a hurry. A reminder of their inability to control events for nuclear survivors mindful of their good fortune every new day and well aware of its fragility. Look, especially the good variety, is a very Japanese preoccupation. This is also a Japanese symbol, but Often we mistake it as being a Chinese one because you might find this character next to the menus at your local takeaway. He is in fact the Japanese lucky cat. And also often we decode him wrong. We think that he's waving, but he isn't. What he's doing is he's beckoning. He's saying, come inside and get lucky. The Japanese believe in mysterious forces as much as space age technology. I didn't see that coming when I installed the sculpture at this Shinto shrine. It was commissioned in 2011, a modern work for an ancient site full of symbolic objects. The sculpture that's inside this big ornate ancient kind of shed is called really shiny stuff that doesn't mean anything. Um, and it's a ball made of stainless steel magnetic objects and they've all collided together and made one big sort of mess. But I guess it's based in this culture of the magpie and anything that's shiny feels like it should be high tech and it should do something, right? It looks alien, so it's come from another place. And then it's landed here in this old school, old world. What I really like is the collision between this thing that looks hyper tech and the ancient. Because it's magnetic, when we were installing it, everyone here at the shrine was super scared of it. They would leave their phones and their credit cards at the entrance to this small island that's surrounded by a moat, and they'd go up to it and approach it with intrepidation, and then worry about headaches because of the energy that this thing would give off. And it occurred to me that maybe it wasn't the magnetic energy that it was giving off, but it was kind of the metaphorical, cultural, symbolic energy. But if my silver sphere was giving off bad energy, visitors didn't have to go far for an antidote. Good luck is big business in Japan, and every shrine stocks talisman designed to see off ill fortune. So this is an Omamori stand. Tell me a little bit about what they cover. Yakuyoke is keeping away the evil spirits. Okay. This is called Negai Goto, and these are for studying. This is for the safe driving. At home, I keep getting speeding tickets on a bridge called the Orwell Bridge, uh -huh. on a road called the A12 by my house. Do you have something that can control the speed cameras? 
I don't think so. This is for wishes? Yes. And I can write art prizes yeah, and sure. all sorts of yeah. things on that, whatever I want. Yeah. And what's in these small bags? I shouldn't open it, so i never seen it inside. So no one ever opens these, otherwise the good luck is gone? Yeah, that's I believe. Is there anything that would ward against cyber attack or email spam? Amulet against calamities. So would that cover natural disasters? I, I believe so. I'm going to have to get one for every eventuality. <laughs> every new year, you renew your omamori. So I have to buy them all again? Yeah. I'm going to have to get Japan, another credit yeah. card. Yeah. <laughs> However modern your problem, Shinto look is always worth a try. All these cars, when the boot opens, you can smell the new carpet, they're all brand new. So I have this feeling that he's blessing them because they are new. It's almost trying to make sure they don't get into accidents. It feels a little bit like a faith-based kind of insurance policy. This is evidence of the Shinto in their everyday reality of life. I mean, it's just blessed a Toyota Corolla. Each of the owners have kids. So it's also like a metaphorical spiritual baby on board sticker somehow. Shinto and Buddhism emphasize our insignificance in the grand scheme. The only sure thing is that time will pass and the seasons will change and nothing sums that up more than this. Japan is renowned for its blossom. And the beauty of it almost means that it becomes a sort of cliché. Now the Japanese climate means that there's a real stark contrast between the seasons. And that wealth of white blossom against the stark blue sky is a message that no one could really mistake. Regeneration and regrowth are big in Japan. Every spring special trains make excursions to get the people to the trees. This is blossom fever. Everywhere you look, there are citizens taking the same photographs they took the year before, and the year before that. These aren't just blooms, and it's not just a love of nature. It's a photographic ritual of spring. A few days of certainty in every year of increasing unpredictability. culture that celebrates change and regeneration is just as well in a country facing demographic disaster. The economy has struggled for years and while the salaryman always symbolised a uniquely Japanese ideal of dedication to the company, a new word, karoshi, it literally means overworked death. Those who can drag themselves home from work aren't making babies, the birth rate is in a steady decline. To make matters worse, Japan has the world's highest population of old people per capita. And they're not the only things that are living longer. 30 years ago, this would have been a symbol of Japanese medinity and industry. But me here looking at it today, it seems like an antiquated relic of technology, which it essentially is. And what's really interesting about the fax machine is, although they've been thrown in skips all around the world, they're still used in Japan. And that's because an aging population refused to do business by email. So you can imagine reels and reels of curly sheets of paper being stored away, undigitized information. It's interesting because in futuristic Japan, it's really the old people that are calling the shots. The old always represented continuity from past to future. But that stopped when the Japanese economy collapsed in the 90s. The office routine, a defining ritual for millions of workers, was suddenly unavailable to a generation that were waiting to start work. So an estimated million of them, hiding the bedrooms of their family homes, consumed with guilt. They're known as the Hikokomori. Journalist Masaki Ikigami writes about this very Japanese problem. Dankai Junior え、この方々は、あの、もう
就労させようという圧力がすごく強かったですねでも結果的にうまくいかなかったそういう社会的な関係性から撤退をするという親に対して申し訳ないという思う気持ちがある一方で。そういう親の世代を中心にやはり会社が全てという価値観で育った人たちにとっては会社に勤める雇用されるということなんだという考え方なんですねでも現実には今もそういうまあパイがないというんですかね環境がないというそこのミスマッチが起きている。Incarnation of a Japanese cowboy because he's a hero but he's also a loner and he lives and dies by an ethical code of principles. Now, physically, he is no more, but metaphorically, he is everywhere. It's almost like he's hiding in plain sight. The samurai conveys Japanese ideas of honor, morality, tradition. But he's here too. In the wide eyed, candy coloured modern world of gaming and animation. This guy's called Gundam. So, any Japanese teenager would know what this is. All those robots that we see, like Transformers, this is the real DNA of that stuff. This is where it all started. He's a legendary 1970s Japanese invention. The styling of him. Is really based in this tradition of the samurai. There's a, all these、uh, samurai swords and samurai knives, and even the body armor in that you would expect to see from the bamboo strips that you find on samurais. For me, it's reminiscent of a lot of things in Japanese culture this compounding of the past tense and the future tense together in a para possible present, a multiple universe or a multiverse, if you like. Here's the samurai Gundam aesthetic for road warriors. I can see his unblinking eye at the heart of the Japanese car industry. Gifting to carbon age technology is ancient martial artiness. The head of design at Nissan is an American. Who had to learn a new culture and iconography on arrival. It's Alfonso Albaisa's job to know which Japanese messages whisper the loudest. The styling of this, in particular, it reminds me of the Gundam figures, the future we've not yet reached. Obviously, in Japan, we have it's a very long history, famously the samurais and all of this kind of、uh, culture,、uh, which then in modern day, Uh, with anime has transformed itself into Gundam, and these kind of iconography is part of the fabric, and especially the fabric of my, my design team. The blade coming off the rear wheel, the samurai sword lunges forward and surging, cutting through tension in the line, emotional geometry, and then these forms that come off of that structure mixed with a warmth, a、yeah. muscle of a warrior figure. Bit of a monster.、Uh, somewhere between a Gundam and Godzilla, its attitude is, is beyond it itself.、Uh, complexity, but harmony.、Uh, this is all Japan、yeah. DNA. So, how long did it take you to adjust your eye to Japanese aesthetics? Because the look of everything is very different to what you were used to in California. Almost every day I wake up, I live in Tokyo. And,、uh, There is some new inspiration and a new thing that I, I didn't know about or I hadn't felt its nuance, and the nuance became apparent. The, the collection of everything is obvious, but each thing is important and has great meaning. So you have to kind of learn each one of those as a designer. Even in complexity,、uh, Japanese are seeking harmony. There is also a sense of humbleness, trust. 
the Japanese consider their actions on other people as a priority. Yeah. So, uh, so when they make an object like this, that's a huge responsibility for my Japanese team. The, the taxis and many parts of Japanese society are comfortably traditional. They're not aging, they don't look, there's no patina, they're immaculate. Um, but on the other hand, the culture and the country is known for progress and change and the future. And they live together, these two things, a uh, polite society that is so respectful, that actually is working every day to break paradigms and to bring the future, a new future. Usually a society that's bent on creating the new has a sense of revolution in every part of its fabric. Japan, no, a, a very old country with deep culture, but is dreaming constantly. and here it is. In the West, we worry about robots, but here they say dozo, come on in. There's a pinch of the samurai in this robotic DNA, and that's because they're just here to serve, nothing more. When they want to impress the Japanese public with 21st century thinking, Tech turns to the symbolic helpmate to embody promises of shiny times to come. Let's shake hands to remember your visit. Ryan, I hear that you are a conceptual artist that is interesting. What's really obvious about Asimo here is that he's incredibly strong and he could probably take me out with one swipe. The other thing that was really interesting when he shook my hand is the attention to detail in the design. His, the, the texture of his hand is really like skin, and it's warm. I really felt like I was shaking hands with a person. You know why they've made him that size? So he's not intimidating. He's a good scale for me as a little friend, because I can get eye-level contact with him. But what's apparent also is he's been pre-programmed with really old-fashioned values and ethics and morals. There's a lot of civility and dignity in him, and he's a really gentle kind of creature. There's a sort of deference to his ancestors, which is essentially me and you. <laughs> Can I pour you a cold drink? Yes, please. Asimo is an internet star who carries an easily understood message about the future and Japan to the outside world. Thank you. Cheers. At home, he says a lot more. Another symbol with multiple meanings to people here. Telling them who they are, who they were, and who they will be. A kit of parts for an idea of Japan.